Welcome to Zero Knowledge, a podcast where we explore the latest in blockchain technology and the decentralized web. The show is hosted by me, Anna. And me, Frederick. In this episode, we sit down with James Prestwich to explore what smart contracts are. Hi, and welcome to another episode of Blockchain 101. Today, we're going to be talking about smart contracts and what they are and what they mean. And uh, hopefully, you're a little bit smarter about the history and, and what this thing is after this episode. And we have a special guest with us today, James. Uh, my name is James Prestwich. I was the co-founder of Storage, and currently I'm the founder of Suma. Suma builds cross-chain smart contracts. And I think it's very cool that you're here with us to talk about smart contracts. Um, maybe we just kick it off with a quick definition of what a smart contract is. So a smart contract is a computer protocol intended to d digitally facilitate, verify, or enforce the negotiation or performance of a contract. A smart contract allows the performance of credible transactions without a third party, and the name has been attributed to Nick Zabo. Apparently, he coined this in 1994. So long before blockchain, Bitcoin, the term smart contract already existed. Now, this is a definition that we just grabbed from Wikipedia. Maybe we can redefine it again. A smart contract. What's a smart contract? Something that I think actually um, is important to note is that the term smart contract has become incredibly overloaded. It seems to mean anything to anyone. Like it's 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 a bunch of different things. So anything from a computer program deployed to a blockchain, you know, that's the generally like accepted nomenclature in the Ethereum space is like anything deployed to the blockchain is a smart contract, and that's what we're talking about. But it doesn't really agree with that original definition from Nick Shabo. So I don't know. I tend to actually avoid talking too much about smart contracts. I will say DAP or I will say like a program in general terms. Uh, and then, you know, whether or not the intention is to actually be a smart contract is left to the author of that code. We all know how contracts work in practice. It's an agreement between humans. If Anna agrees to sell me her car and I give her the money, that means the car is mine. Smart contracts are ways that we can automate some or all of that so that Anna doesn't have to trust me to give her the money. And maybe in the future, I don't have to trust her to give me the title to the car. And all of it would basically be written in code. And once certain, once certain conditions are met, then the transaction would automatically be completed. Exactly. Now, that's just a program. That's like, that's something that's been around for a long time. So what makes it smart? I guess in, in the original terms, what makes it smart is that automation factor. Um, while programs have been around for a long time, you know, contracts are still very much like in, in meat space. It's a thing that people agree with and the intention is interpreted by lawyers and judges. And, uh, there's a whole, you know, ecosystem defined around making a contract a contract. Hmm. So the smart part is that we can eliminate all that overhead and do it automatically. And it's not really been possible to do that automatically with money before blockchain because you always have to involve some third party in this thing that is not automatable. You can't automate the banks because you have to trust the banks to do what they say they're going to do. Mm. Uh, or like if it's just an agreement between you and me, then, you know, I can't automate you giving me cash. So there, there has, the automation part just hasn't really existed before. But don't you think, I mean, at least maybe we should talk a little bit about the history of this smart contract concept, because the way I've understood it is like smart contracts only really become smart because they're on the blockchain and because they're they're dealing with something like, you know, for sure this is going to happen and cannot be corrupted because you could always make a program that would actually automate stuff, but there's no proof that that wouldn't get that that couldn't be tampered with or it couldn't be altered right. or somehow yeah changed. so i mean 
Yeah, in my definition of automate there, I mean it to be like undeniably so. Like it will happen and, you know, there's proofs generated that X or Y has happened. Uh, There's an audit trail or whatever it may be. We say that the term smart contract is over 20 years old, but we've only actually seen them implemented and used in the wild in the last few years. And I think that the you know, trustless nature of a blockchain explains that. We thought these up 20 years ago, and we only managed just now to build something that makes them useful. Going back to your point of history, I think, yeah, the terms were around, but with Bitcoin, there is a Bitcoin script. You can automate stuff in Bitcoin. You can actually do a reasonably you know, large amount of stuff with Bitcoin script. It was, It's just very hard, <laughs> and it's... Uh, You can do a lot, but you can't do everything. And so like part of Vitalik's original motivation, his vision of why he wanted to do anything other than Bitcoin was to be able to do more, to have a more complete Bitcoin script and that you could do more stuff with. And so that vision eventually evolved into Ethereum. And now we have this smart contract platform. And it's really like Ethereum that popularized the term because it's this Kind of, they branded themselves uh, from the beginning as a smart contract platform. James, you've been in the space a fair amount of time. Do you know if was there ever a project before Ethereum that claimed to create smart contracts, or is that really something that was ushered in with the creation of Ethereum? So, in my subjective experience, working in the space when Ethereum was announced before it existed, there wasn't anything out there trying to do smart contracts or you know, generalized contracts. There were a number of projects like Saya that were trying to do some special purpose computation on chain. So doing special transaction types that would enforce a very specific contract that was hard coded into the blockchain. Um, I see Ethereum less as a reaction to Bitcoin script and more as a reaction to these kinds of special application specific chains. Ethereum is a chain that can do anything that any application specific chain could do. Yeah, so Ethereum is this generalized platform. But the interesting thing to me is that now all the blockchains that are like coming after Ethereum, there are actually some of those like application specific ones as well. And I've actually seen a little bit of a reaction back to this like domain specific model of blockchains because the general ones have scalability problems. Uh, then, yeah, like the domain specific blockchain uh, is a sensible thing but then the question is how do you secure it if we have millions of blockchains then you know you're splitting the security across these millions of blockchains and how does this actually really work you may also i wonder would you also end up with like different languages being used to create these smart contracts different standards in certain domains that won't absolutely be understood by others definitely there's a bunch of problems spawning up around this for sure but then There is still this overall general arc of like, you're not taken seriously as a blockchain unless you are a smart contract platform. Like if we look at Definity that we had on this episode, for instance, they're also talking about smart contract, like general smart contract platform. So I think that there is still, you know, a lot of innovation and a lot of stuff happening here. Mm -hmm. And yeah, the space is super new. I mean, we got to remember that, you know, even 94 is not that long time ago (laughs) and Ethereum has not been around for that long and uh, like we're still learning what this actually means and how to do it well. So we just I think we made one distinguish. We There's like one blockchain that isn't really using smart contracts, which is Bitcoin. However, one could argue that there's now like layer two that's definitely trying to allow for more smart contract like activity to be happening. Can you can we talk a little bit about that? Well, uh, I would actually disagree that Bitcoin doesn't support smart contracts. Okay. I think it doesn't support Ethereum-style smart contracts. In Bitcoin, you're very limited to what you can read and write to the chain. Um, Whereas in Ethereum, it's very freeform. You can read and write anything. Um, But Bitcoin does support adding constraints around transactions. It supports time locks. It supports, you know, specifying who's allowed and when they're allowed to spend funds. And you can actually use that to automate, you know, pretty significant portions of real life contracts. So I think we might be talking about a very narrow set of contracts on Bitcoin, but I would disagree that it doesn't support them. Maybe to word that better is it sounds like Bitcoin can support financially driven smart contracts where it's all about funds but not sort of the more general smart contracts, which are not involving funds. 
Yeah, um, I think that's a pretty fair description. And, you know, even within the realm of financially driven contracts, there are some things that you can do with Solidity on Ethereum that you can't do with script on Bitcoin. So I think that brings us uh, to talking a little bit about, you know, this is a one on one episode <laughs> and we've dug into a little bit of the history and the terminology. I typically, like I said, say that it's just like a program deployed to a blockchain and then you know, what is the actual use case? And from that determine, you know, is this intended to be a contract or not? So what are actual practical use cases of smart contracts or, or blockchain applications? And I think that's where a lot of confusion and a lot of division in communities happen is that we say smart contracts and different people mean different things. Some people just want to deploy an app that is, you know, dealing with data. They want a decentralized Twitter. They want the general decentralized internet. They're not dealing with money. They, they're not necessarily even dealing with trust. They just want that decentralized data and audit trail. Mm. Whereas, uh, some people, you know, want absolute smart contracts in the original definition of this is a contract between you and me. And if, you know, this should be enforceable and, yeah, contract in every sense of the term. Uh, I definitely fall more into the latter camp. I think that finance is the most interesting and mature use case for a blockchain. And uh, when we're talking about blockchains as public infrastructure, I think that we suffer from a bit of a tragedy of the commons when we get into the more general purpose data-driven apps. Twitter on the blockchain is not a scalable app. We we can't actually replicate every tweet to every node in Ethereum, every block. It's a uh, it's a bit painful. We can, but the problem is that the incentives are not aligned correctly and we've had a whole episode on this, which uh I can't oh. remember which number it is, but the episode with Phil Dion on storage room. Hmm. If everyone was willing to pay to store everyone else's tweet, then it would work. <laughs> but people are not willing to do that. So that's why um, this kind of architecture and why a lot of people say we can't just port you know, centralized internet things to mm. decentralized internet. Yeah. Is that where the, sch the schism, like, is that one of the big issues between the Bitcoin folks and the Ethereum folks is should smart contracts be used for non-financial purposes is that is that actually one of the main things that people are arguing I'm about i'm not sure if the it's it's the main thing but it's certainly one of the things it's definitely one of the things so like for example luke jr one of the bitcoin devs will go as far as to call most transactions on chain spam this started back in like 2013 with um satoshi dice and all the gambling sites that were popular then um, I don't think it's the core of the schism here, but I think it is, you know, one of the battlegrounds. Speaking on the practical side, a question that I get a lot when talking about smart contracts is like, I hear about this world computer. I hear there's like this VM. This is usual. I talk mostly to programmers in my life. <laughs> so it's mostly from programmers, but who come from this perspective of like, I don't really understand what, what you're talking about. What is the VM and where does that live? A VM is like a very common thing. I run a VM in Docker. Why do I have to like write solidity for this VM? And like, how is this different? And I think on that level, like technically, I think the only really interesting thing to say is that, you know, the world computer is this decentralized peer-to-peer -peer network that's running blockchain clients. In the blockchain clients is a virtual machine, much like WebAssembly or um, the Java VM or something like that, except that it's fully deterministic. And that's really what defines a blockchain VM. It's fully deterministic VM. And because we, like in the Ethereum world, there was a completely new VM invented. That's why we kind of need these smart programming languages, and it's a kind of a different domain. Um, but we're seeing now with new blockchains that they're coming up with more standardized VMs like WebAssembly VMs. And so we were kind of expanding our horizon, standardizing cross fields. So on that end, like I think we've, in the blockchain world, kind of, 
mysticized the smart contracts stuff a little bit too much and practically it's it's the same kind of computer software that we're used to dealing with it just ships in a different form it's transactions across a peer-to-peer network um i usually think about this from the consensus perspective the goal of bitcoin and the goal of blockchains was to get a bunch of computers to agree on some shared state right some shared information and do it in a way that's safe and trustless and everybody arrives at the same conclusion in bitcoin we do that with transactions and unspent transaction outputs and we agree on who owns how much money in ethereum we do it with transactions and smart contract code and we agree on you know just about anything we can write any kind of state we want to the blockchain so you know when we're talking about the evm you know that is what runs the smart contract code that decides what to write to the chain when you call it and to your points you can think of it as a world computer because this virtual machine has persistent global memory uh, that is essentially infinite it's not practically infinite but you know from a programming model it's infinite that's a starting point for at least developers to start thinking about like the these are the building blocks that we're building on and keep a, keep that in mind as we go into more abstract levels of talking about smart contracts so going back to practical use cases what are some good use cases of financial smart contracts at Suma, for example, we build uh, cross-chain smart contracts. We build ways to exchange and hedge risk between Bitcoin and Ethereum and a few other chains. So, you know, in this case, what we're doing is we're providing a financial contract that meets the buyer's real-world asset management needs. And we're helping two people enter the, into that contract trustlessly and, you know, execute and settle on-chain. Some of the most widely deployed contracts recently have been token sales. Um, these go all the way back to 2016. So, for example, you have Gollum and Gnosis, whose sale of tokens was done by an on-chain contract. So if you have you know, your Ether and you want their tokens, the smart contract enforces the terms of that exchange. Other things being done with smart contracts recently include non-fungible tokens like CryptoKitties. We have some people working on um, multi-sig wallets, so custody solutions written as a smart contract. I think when we're talking about money and smart contracts or like money uses of smart contracts, um, things like CryptoKitties should be included, even though, it, you know, depending on whose definition you follow, Cryptocurrencies are not money either. <laughs> so maybe let's say value. Mm. And people do find value in digital scarcity. Like that is a, a thing and people want trading cards and they find value in knowing that this is the only card in the world that, you know, looks like this. And uh, like this is something that is actually enforceable on the blockchain and it is a good use case and in the real world we trust uh what's the company behind magic the gathering Whatever. wizards of the coast <laughs> wizards of the coast we trust that they're not going to print more of these cards uh, mm -hmm. and in the blockchain world uh, we don't actually have to trust anyone to to do that so i think that's actually a valid use case yeah it's interesting um the idea of you know, unique digitally scarce assets on a blockchain goes back, you know, a number of years. I don't know if we actually already spoke about that, that like this idea of scarcity, the idea of the limit on the number of tokens, the limit, the limits are actually what are making value in this. I mean, if that's the idea that if you create something scarce, I mean, actually, what we're actually talking about here are like NFTs, non fungible tokens, which is a word and term that gets thrown around a lot right now people are very excited about it i'm i'm gonna be like super contrarian here for a second uh people getting excited about nfts are getting excited about the fact that things can be different from each other <laughs> like this this isn't a, a new or innovative concept for 
But um, I guess provably different from each other in a way without, like you said, without this third party that has said, yeah, no, I've only released 100 into the world. This is like, there can only be 100 in the world. Yeah. Going back to your earlier point, though, um, you can think of a blockchain as a smart contract itself. It's an agreement between all of the users about you know, how the chain should run and should update state and issue new coins. Everybody agrees to those terms. They opt into it by running the software and by owning Ether and using smart contracts. So it's an agreement between humans that is automated by software. You know, that fits our earlier definitions of smart contracts pretty well, I think. It, so I would extend that to be it's an agreement between humans or between machines. Because very often, and like what a lot of people talk about in being excited about blockchain, is it does actually allow a machine to enter into a contract as well. I, I agree. Um, one of the really cool things about this is that you can give machines custody of your funds on your behalf by giving them your private key and writing software that signs transactions. Um, but I think that the human element here is extremely important. Um, if you look at like the 2016 Geth parity consensus failure, when Geth and parity started you know, working on different Ethereum chains for a while, or if you look at the earlier consensus failure around Bitcoin 0.7 and 0.8, what happened there is the machines stopped agreeing and humans had to come in and clean it up and reach agreement. So uh, I, I look at the software as you know, agents of humans here more than as something that is itself part of the agreement. And I think, I mean, what you just described sort of leads us into a point that we did want to talk about, and that is like the security of smart contracts or how can smart contracts actually fail? What's the problem with them? So far, we've just spoken about how neat they are and how many cool things they can do. But what is what is the problem with smart contracts? How can those things actually happen? So I think that goes back to the different use cases that people imagine. And I mean, I've heard arguments that you should not touch smart contracts un unless you're willing to like do like write your entire smart contract and by code and formally prove that it's correct to your intention. And like, that's the only thing that should ever touch a chain. And if that's the model, then only like contracts that are expected to deal with multi-million dollars and only the people who are like beneficiaries of those contracts would be able to write them because like they're the only ones that would have enough funds to actually do that so it becomes a, a an horribly intractable thing to do and it's like really hard um, and that's why i think a lot of people get more excited about the the general dapps sphere because it's much more relaxed and like the attitude is that anyone can get into it but now you kind of have both of these worlds playing in the same space and it becomes really hard to deal with. Like you have people coming from like, oh, I want to build a game. And then suddenly they're like, maybe they don't intend to deal with money, but suddenly they, like, they add a feature so that they are. And now like they haven't formally proven their by code. <laughs> and yeah, it, it's a security problem. Not necessarily of any inherent property of any system, but as a mentality and as a way to look at this and think about it. And I think this goes back to a point that we've raised a few times in the podcast generally, which is about like how how different working in this space is to like the usual startup land of like move fast and break things, which what I'm hearing here is that like because of the flexibility of smart contracts, you will have people who join who maybe aren't being as careful with their code and they're not auditing it and they're not looking as closely as they should. And then because they're just trying to build stuff that's cool, and like you said, maybe money gets involved in it or they don't expect it to be such huge volumes of money being involved in. All of a sudden, the stakes are higher. A bug or something happens because the code just wasn't like right from the start. Um, and a lot of people get really angry. And I guess the confidence for some people, the confidence in smart contracts as a concept kind of goes away or, or lessens somehow. When we're talking about writing smart contracts that deal with other people's money, we need to have a very high standard of care as developers. Um, I don't think that it's necessary to go as far as formal verification and mathematical proofs of the correctness of your contract in most cases. But 
compared to normal software, we should be writing this extremely carefully. And if you look at past failures of smart contracts, usually it comes down to the developer misunderstanding some aspect of the language or some aspect of the chain. And the contract fails because the developer doesn't have a perfect understanding of what he's written or she's written. And, you know, I know myself as a developer, uh, I barely understand how my home stereo set works. Sometimes I can get it to play music. I, I think, you know, as someone developing smart contracts, I'm not equipped to understand every piece of such a complex system. I'm constantly terrified that I'm going to mess something up. And as a result, you know, I submit my code to independent auditors. Mm -hmm. But because of the way that Ethereum works and the way Solidity is structured and the way that EVM works, I can never be 100% sure that my code is bug free. And that's problematic. I think that goes back to the immaturity of the system as a whole. And like I said, we're really early in this space. We really kind of don't know what we're doing as a society. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we're still developing a lot of these tools. And I mean, we we spoke to Griff in an episode and he shared his story of the, how the DAO bug happened. And he was programming Solidity and at a time where... You know, there was no payable modifier in the language. You could send money anywhere. Another thing that terrifies me is that the Solidity compiler itself hasn't had an audit. Like, who mm -hmm. knows if there's a bug in the Solidity compiler and every smart contract ever Whoa. has bugs in them. Like, we don't really know. There's researchers doing analysis of bytecode on chain right now. And, you know, they're finding stuff. They're not finding anything massive and super upsetting. But it's still like so early in the space the tooling is not there to have the right confidence to deal with the kind of money that we're usually dealing with right and on that note it's been very interesting to see the evolution of solidity over time in response to things like the dow vulnerability the introduction of the payable keywords the focus on adding you know more checks to your contract to make sure that things work how you think they do has been really interesting. I think Solidity is something that's teaching us a lot of lessons about how to design smart contract systems on chain and how to design languages for them. I think the, the main takeaway, though, from the downside and from the difficulty in doing this is that it's not something that is inherent to the system. There is nothing that says we will not never get to a point where all smart contracts are automatically mathematically proven correct. It's unlikely that will happen in the next 10 years, but there's nothing that says that that is an impossible thing to achieve. Hmm. Would that be formal verification like built in? Exactly. Yeah. I agree with that on the level of the code itself. We can you know, get to a point where every smart contract is formally verified, where we know that it behaves exactly as written and that there are no bugs present. What we can't do is prove things about user interactions in that smart contract. For example, you know, one of my side projects that I work on and talk about is uh, minor front running. Um, we can write smart contracts and prove how they behave, but then when we get to the user interaction point, miners have an advantage in interacting with smart contracts. They get to see what transactions are going to occur, decide what transactions are allowed in a block, and insert any of their own along the way. And so if you're on a decentralized exchange and trading with a miner, they will always make more money than you because they see your trades and can respond before they happen. So the idea of shared state in these smart contract systems where users can interact directly is always going to be a little bit problematic. Yeah, and I think that, I mean, that's a particular property of a blockchain. So I think that's why innovation in the blockchain space is still super duper important. We're not done here. Like, that's a thing that I try to tell everyone all the time. It's an immature space. We're still working on this stuff. We're not done. 
And there's nothing that says that we can't have shielded transactions everywhere, even in smart contracts. Um, like Parity has the secret store that allows you to have pri- private transactions. The only thing you commit to to chain is is like a state route, and then the the state exchange is happening off chain. So you could run a decentralized exchange where you know miners only get to see some hashed value. Uh, and everyone else who's participating in the system are sharing their keys in some other way. And so, like, we can build all of this stuff into the blockchain and make things better. And I think that's what I want people to be working on is making things better. I think that makes a lot of sense, this idea that we're going, like, I think in over our talk, you know, even though we're highlighting a lot of the problems or the things that could go wrong with smart contracts, I think we do have to continue to, like, remember that they are really interesting. There's a lot of potential value in them and that you shouldn't hear about these problems and sort of throw them out the window. Be like, ah, screw them. Like, don't touch them because they're dangerous. Because I think that there is too much potential in that. There's too much that you could actually be doing with them. I had asked the question, what was, what's an example of a financial, financially driven smart contract? But now I'm kind of curious, are there examples of like non-value bearing or non-financial smart contracts as well? I think there's a couple of good examples. Yeah, there's more bad examples than good ones right now. And, you know, anyone working in the blockchain industry sees all of these bad examples all the time coming through and people kind of wanting to do everything in smart contracts. And I don't think that's necessarily a good idea. But there are definitely good use cases. So a very well known problem in DNS that's been around forever and is still very much a problem and and we don't really know how to solve it and has been plaguing the internet forever and that is certificates like how do you do certificate management for the internet in general for dns and the existing solutions of having like root certifiers that are trusted it's not working out all that well because it turns out that some can't really be trusted and it's a huge system that is extracting a lot of money from people for questionable value and shouldn't this be like a first principle kind of thing that everything is encrypted online and all these kinds of aspects with a dns system that is an existing system that really kind of shit and that solved very well with smart contracts in like ens which is um you know maybe they don't have the perfect solution but it's trying to solve that problem of how do i provide a certificate to prove that I own like this address Mm. or how do I, you know, actually say I like in, in the internet world, it would be, how do I prove that I own this domain? Like I would encrypt it and then I have a certificate, you know, signed with the same key that I encrypted the domain with whatever, like some scheme where I can actually show that I own both. And then you can trust this without having like a central, certifying body that you're trusting well uh ens you put up a deposit right yeah but that's for other properties i mean you could have such a certificate system where i like provide an sl certificate that is linked to my private key in some way and that's all registered on chain and if you want to like have encrypted chat with me all you have to trust is that i own this address or something maybe maybe we should back up a few steps then and say that um one of the current problems on the internet is it's very difficult to associate a domain name which humans can read with an ip address which computers can read safely to solve this we invented a complex system of you know certificates where some authority will say that google.com is 8.8.8.8 or whatever google is right so an authority will associate that name with that IP address. And so when we introduce ENS, suddenly we have an authority that's the blockchain. It's not a trusted third party anymore. Mm. We can go to the chain and see that the on-chain owner of that domain has certified a specific IP address. And that's a non-financial transaction, but it's still something that's extremely valuable and extremely important that we have a blockchain to arbitrate it. And it sounds like this also would link to this concept of identity on the blockchain. So having worked on the pickups project during the Polkadot sale and like actually seen some of the, you know, inner workings of what a KYC would look like. I mean, that is also a non-financial. This is just basically linking your identity to 
some address or to something. Um, that is, an, I guess, another example of a non-financial use of a smart contract. I think that while smart contracts have a lot of extremely compelling use cases, uh, 95% of them don't need a token and are made worse by tokens. Um, so a lot of people are taking this very short-term oriented view where a token helps them raise money to create something. But I think that in the long run, we're going to see a lot of people regretting that because the, in my experience, the token makes it more difficult to create a working product and a working system. I'd also say that's the biggest problem I see. I mean, there's a lot of bad ideas out there and a lot of misguided efforts to put things on the blockchain. But at the same time, I, I wouldn't be one to discourage experimentation. But a big problem is that everyone wants to attach a token one problem is that it fundamentally changes how they have to build a product and it's probably just worse. Uh, but another thing is that they're also kind of damaging themselves. I mean, if, if um, someone deploys an application um, that's useful and people want to use it and they don't want to deal with the token, there's nothing stopping them from copying that contract and redeploying it without the token. And so, I mean, we fundamentally have to treat every single thing deployed to the blockchain as open source code. And so, you know, open source code, you can copy it and change it and redeploy it. So any sort of profit model, any sort of token that doesn't need to be there can be removed. And, and maybe and, will be removed. And is if, highly likely to be removed if, it in, if indeed it's not necessary. If the, if the contract is useful and the token is not. Yeah. So let's bring it back to smart contracts and why smart contracts are great. At this point, like I'd like to take a second. I think through the podcast so far, I've had negative opinions on tokens, non-fungible tokens, rich statefulness, the idea of smart contracts, sometimes on Ethereum, maybe a few other things. You know, all of that notwithstanding, smart contracts are interesting enough and powerful enough that I spend 80% of my waking life writing them, and then the other 20% thinking about them. And then I think I dream about them most nights, too. What, what's a smart contract dream like? Very boring. <laughs> but, uh, you know, this is something that, despite the issues so far, you know, is going to be extremely powerful and extremely important going forward. I think that's uh, the opinion of most people I've met who are serious in this space, that they're getting involved because they see a lot of potential in what you can build and that it is fundamentally different. It's, it's, it's all of these properties that we always talk about with blockchain transparent, you know, traceable, whatever, whatever. And, um, it's just a new paradigm and we haven't really figured it out yet, but it's, it, it feels like it has incredible potential. I have a thought on this is I'm wondering if like right now anyone can write a smart contract. I could write a smart contract. It's, I mean, anyone being able to write a smart contract is maybe part of the amazingness of it. It's distributing all of that power to all of these people. But as we know, with all systems which have distributed power to all of those people, there's unintended consequences. If everyone can write a smart contract and there's so many ways to break it, then you're going to run into a lot of problems. So I think there's this balance of, that I, I think is sort of emerging of like how to make sure that they're done correctly and how to make sure that they're you know, not going to damage a lot of people. Also finding people in the space who can become true experts on it. And systems that can help make sure that these things that are deployed are deployed in a way that's like smart and careful um, without obviously ruining the ability of people to jump in and get their hands dirty. Yeah, I definitely agree. Um, I think we're going to eventually treat important smart contracts the way we treat airplanes or other you know, high assurance environment where there's going to be known procedures for writing something that is unlikely to fail, where there's going to be checklists on checklists and where it's going to pass through multiple layers of sign-off. It'll be super unsexy. Extremely unsexy. 
Yeah, I think you're right. And uh, the problem that we have right now is that we we don't even have those fundamentals in place where we can say, you know, oh, this this was a mistake. Let's fix it. That is not possible uh, in the current framework. And we're seeing that we're kind of getting there. We had to talk with Zeppelin on a previous episode where they're talking about smart contract upgradability. That's like one piece of it. Um, I know uh, when I talked to Griff that, you know, he has a vision of like every token basically having its own little proof of, of authority system so that, you know, you can kind of have an escape hatch and call back everything because all the ether is wrapped. And so you can kind of wind things back on chain without having to, you know, actually uh, do a hard fork or anything like that. And then as you increase the like trust and reliance of the software, you can remove these security features and make them kind of more trustless over time. Which is interesting because that's essentially the way the financial system works right now is uh, trades between brokerages go through a clearinghouse and the clearinghouse has the power to wind back trades or they go through an exchange which has the power to wind back trades in the event of major failures. The What the blockchain provides is a way to remove that once we feel ready to do so. Soon enough, we're going to feel comfortable turning that off for specific areas of the financial system. And I think that those are the most useful and compelling places to implement smart contracts. Right now. Right now. And, you know, it's going to expand going forward as we get better smart contracts and uh, a, a better ecosystem. Hopefully we've conveyed what a smart contract is and what the potential is, what the downsides are, and given an idea of like, how we as people working in this industry think about it and how we like talk about it and how we construct our opinions around it. Uh, and because it's a very high level topic, I think that's what's um, needed to, to try to teach people what a smart contract is. It's not just a slow program. It's not just like you're dealing with properties of a whole system. It's not just the, the code that we're dealing with. To tie it all back together, I think that, you know, smart contracts are contracts. They only exist between people. You know, they exist for a purpose. And that's what we should be talking about. I think so. My my takeaway is very much around this idea of smart contracts being this way that a lot of people can get involved and jump in and start, you know, creating these pretty powerful, pretty interesting, decentralized applications, things that can happen without an intermediary. And Ethereum provided this way to do it really easily, which is awesome. But at the same time, because it's so easy and so awesome, a lot of people have gotten in and have not necessarily recognized their own power and aren't necessarily trained to do that. And I think that always when talking about smart contracts, it comes back to that, that there's a lot of like really bright people doing it, maybe which is like not a full oversight of what the consequence of their actions will be all getting together and building a bunch of stuff. And I think it's going to be exciting, but I do think it, it, it requires thought about process and like how to eventually make this something that's a little bit safer for the whole world. So on that note, thank you very much, James, for joining the podcast and helping us uncover smart contracts and for the conversation. No, thanks for having me guys. And to our listeners, thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.